Hi, my name is Allison and I am an educator at the St. Louis Zoo. And I am so excited today to be able to present the webinar, What the Bones Know With You. Now, you may notice that I have a mask on around my neck. So I am doing what I can to help prevent the spread of the COVID-19 virus. But because I am alone by myself in this room in my house today, I have pulled it down from off of my face uh, because we are all properly social distanced. <laughs> You're in your homes and I am in mine. Um, I have a few things to go over before we start talking about bones today. So I'm going to be sharing my screen as we go over our community standards. All right, so these are our community learning standards. Now, if you have joined us for a webinar before, these will seem pretty familiar to you, but worth going over again. Uh, so if you have not found the chat box already, please go ahead and find that, set that to all participants and attendees that you're responding to, and remember to be respectful in the chat box while you're in there. Um, let's go ahead and use that Q&A box too, those questions and answers. So if you have a question or if you're wondering about something while I'm presenting, go ahead and submit those questions there. And I will do my best to answer as many as I can at the end of today's webinar. Uh, please remember to use the chat box to respond um, and interact in regards to today's webinar. And also understand that if we're not being respectful, my moderator behind the scenes, Kim, in her house, uh, may elect to remove you from today's webinar. I don't think it's going to be a problem, but worth mentioning anyway. All right, so once again, before we get started, if you have not found the chat box already, please let me know where you are zooming in from and how many people are viewing this webinar today with you on your device. Uh, once again, put those questions in the Q&A. And like I said, Kim is behind the scenes moderating for me. So you may see her pop in and out of the chat box with some information as well. And then at the very end of today's webinar, we will be uh, doing a brief enjoyment poll because we want to know what you guys think of these as well. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Oh my gosh, and I see so many people responding with where they're from too. It's so neat to see where you all are from. So, all right, so today, bones, right? What do the bones know? Um, well, they know a lot and they can tell us a lot. Um, but I do want to mention at the beginning of today's webinar that I have a very, um, I just have something that I want to say. So I am honored to be able to present parts of the Zoo's BioFact collection with you today. And part of that collection includes replicas, but it does include real bones. So we will be viewing real bones today. Um, and I say I'm honored because this is a really, really special thing that sometimes after an animal passes away, after natural causes at the zoo, we may preserve things like bones to use for educational purposes. It gives us a chance to see these, this animal's wonderful adaptations in a way that we may not normally otherwise be able to. Uh, so these items are treated with an immense amount of respect and I am so fortunate to be able to share some of these things with you from my home. Um, I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it. it. It's a really an amazing thing and I feel very fortunate to share that with you today. So, but what about bones? Right? If we think about bones in a very basic level, right, it provides support to our body, right? All vertebrates have an internal skeleton of some sort. Um, some animals have more bones than others. You know, in our human body, it's 206, pretty standard across the board. And bones protect our vital organs like our lungs and our heart. They are a spot for blood cell production, right? They're really, really important structures. But if we look closely at the fascinating living tissue that is bone, we can really start to understand that animal in a way that we might not be able to just watching it. So we will be looking at some bones up close today. And I'm going to be sharing a view on my phone, which will act as like a document camera, so that we can look at some of these things together in a way that we can't normally. So pretty, pretty cool. <laughs> 
All right, so with that, I think I'm going to go ahead and switch over to my phone camera. All right, so before we get all of, to all of these beautiful things right here, I do want to talk about just some basic features that make bone special. Um, so with bone, there are two different kinds of bone. There's compact and spongy. Right. Compact is, of course, compact. It's really solid bone. And that's where, if you're just looking at one, that's what you see on the outside. But inside is that spongy bone. And depending on the animal, they could have more compact bone or more spongy bone, um, depending on maybe if they're a water animal or a land animal, if they fly like birds, um, if the bone is experiencing different kinds of stressors with muscles and ligaments being attached to it, but um, I've got this really cool thing to show you. So here we go. This is a mount, is what we call it, of a mammal bone and a bird bone. So our mammal bone is on this side, and our bird bone is on this side. I'm going to try to get a little bit closer so you can see. That compact bone is that solid part around the outside that we're looking at. And then the spongy bone is kind of that Swiss cheese looking <laughs> bone in the middle there. And in things like mammals, you tend to have more spongy bone around the ends of the bone. So what we might call um, like the head of the bone or a trochanter, some of these really fascinating anatomical terms. <laughs> and we will be talking about a few today. All right, so that's the spongy bone. And if you've ever heard of someone saying, you know, birds, birds have hollow bones and that's why they can fly. Well, we're looking at a bird bone right here. And it's not hollow, it's just mostly spongy bone. That compact layer on the outside is very, very thin. But that spongy bone does allow for less weight, making it easier for the bird to fly. So our basic features of bones. Now I thought we would kind of explore some of these things in a choose your own adventure manner. <laughs> so I have some polls ready to go and my different bones are numbered and you all are going to vote on which bone you would like to know more about. Which one piques your curiosity? So if we can go ahead and show the poll and I want to see which one you guys would like to see first. Which bone? All right, and Kim, you're going to have to let me know the results of the poll, too. <laughs> Please and thank you. Sounds good. We have 11, 12 out of 19 people that have voted. So I see we're going to close in five, four, three, two, and one. Um, Allison, we have a tie exactly oh. between bones number two, three, and six. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> okay, well. <laughs> you all made it very easy for me. So two, three, and six it is. And we'll just go in numerical order to keep it easy on us today. <laughs> Thank you all for making my job just a smidgen bit easier. So bone number two is a rib bone, as I said. And right, we all have ribs. You can probably feel your ribs right now. And they protect our thoracic organs. So like those lungs and the heart. So this is really important stuff. Um, there's really not a lot to a rib, is there? I mean, it's, it's kind of flat, kind of straight. Uh, this rib bone is specifically from a manatee, uh, was donated to us. And you can see it's really, really big, right? It's just absolutely huge. But we have these little bumps and flat pieces right here. So this is where the rib bone would articulate, is what we would call it, with the vertebrae. So it'll just be an area of attachment. And in the body, there's some cartilage here providing a little bit of cushion. So pretty cool. Now, what's really interesting, I was researching manatee ribs because, you know, it's a rib. We kind of know what they do. But some researchers at the University of Florida were doing um, some like stress tests on manatees, as manatees are endangered species. And something that they encounter in the wild is unfortunately boat strikes because manatees, if you've not seen one, they're very cute, they're very blobular, they move very slow, boats move very fast. And what they found 
is that their bones act more like a ceramic substance than something harder. So they're trying to figure out what that means um, in terms of maybe redesigning boat, uh, boats, putting in safety features, how we can make these fun recreational opportunities safe for our friendly neighborhood sea cows down in Florida and the Gulf. So pretty cool, rib bones, who knew? <laughs> All right, so let's go on to bone number three. Well, I should say bones, plural, because there's more than one bone <laughs> attached to here. We've articulated some pieces of a cow foot bone. All right, so this is the toes. So this is where the cow would stand. And we call cows and other ungulates, other animals with hooves, uh, we call them digitigrade animals in terms of how they move and how they locomote. So they are like tiptoe walkers. If we're thinking of how we place our foot on the ground, us humans, we're plantigrade, our feet fall flat on the ground. Uh, something like our house cats or our dogs are digitigrade. It's like they're walking on their tiptoes. Right? So they're not all the way up on the top of their toe. But an animal that is undulated, like a cow, is all the way up on a toe, kind of like if you, um, a ballerina who is on point, right, all the way up on the toe. And then there's that huge hoof, that nail, and some other soft tissues that help cushion and protect the rest of the foot. So what's interesting is that we can think of this as like the bone that's at the very tip of your toe or your finger. So like just this, this bone right here, just that bone. And the other bones of your toe or finger right here. And then this is a foot bone. So in us, we have many of these because we have five toes, right? The cow only has two. And then the cow's ankle, its ankle joint is actually up here. So if you've ever watched a cow move and have been kind of fascinated by how their leg works, that's why it may look a little bit backwards because their joints the same ones we have, our ankles, our knees, and our hips, are just spread out in a little bit of a different way that helps them move in a different way. Pretty neat. Um, what's also really cool, I think you can see on this cow, is this little line right here. And this is what's left of something called an epiphyseal plate. Now, when we're growing, the space between this part of the bone and this part of the bone is filled with cartilage. And that cartilage, as we grow and develop into adults, eventually turns into bone. And then what's left is this line right here. So if we find a bone, um, especially a long bone of like the leg or the arm, we could determine if that animal was young or if it was fully grown as an adult. So other things I wanna point out on this bone, because it's easier to see uh, with something that's a lot larger, are these different holes, right? All of these different holes. Now these holes aren't from wear and tear. These holes are here for a purpose. Um, they are called fossa. And that's where things like nerves and arteries and veins go into the bone, right? Because our spongy bone, inside of our bone, bone marrow, that's where our red blood cells are produced in mammals and other vertebrates. Um, so it needs a way to get out, right? And Blood vessels is how we do that. So there's a purpose to all of these holes, except these, this is just for our purposes to keep the, the bones together. So we can see how they connect and move. Pretty cool stuff, I think. <laughs> all right, and let's move on to our last, which is number six. And this is a beaver skull. So the manatee rib and the cow foot bones that we saw were real. My beaver skull here is a replica. So it's just a really high quality replica molded off of a real beaver skull, but it's made out of hard plastic. Um, since bone is a living tissue, once you preserve it, and you take away that blood supply that's not moving in there anymore, real bone actually becomes very brittle and very fragile. And so we have a number of replicas in our collection too, especially if they're things that we look at a lot. So here's our beautiful beaver skull. Those great chomping incisors, good for gnawing down those trees. Our molars in the back, good for chewing. 
And with our beaver, right, besides just looking at these teeth and going, yep, it's a herbivore, the skull also provides us another clue to let us know that it's a herbivore. And it's how it articulates, how the cranium and the mandible, excuse me, <laughs> mandible connect together. And if we try to mimic how it chews, it's very easy for it to move back and forth in a grinding fashion. Because that's how herbivores choose, right? They have to grind and really whoosh down all of that plant material that they're eating really, really well. So, and that's just right here. So right here is where these processes, anything that kind of sticks out on a bone is called a process, will fit and connect with the cranium so that the beaver can eat its food. So another great thing to look at in skulls, I'm gonna take the bottom part off here so we can see it a little bit easier, is eye placement. Right, a good rhyme, if you haven't heard it yet, eyes in front, likes to hunt, eyes on the side, run and hide. And so our beaver eyes are set off just a little bit more to the side than say something like um, a mountain lion or a seal even. And even depending on and if how this bone is shaped around the eye area can give us a clue as to what, what kind of animal it is. For instance, if there was bone all the way around protecting the eye, even in the back, that would give us a clue that we could be looking at something like a primate skull, right? If those eyes were more located in the front, allowing for binocular vision and depth perception so that you know how far to jump on your prey. We know that's a predator, right? The eyes are on the side. We know it's an animal that needs a larger range of vision around its side and behind itself to keep watch. Okay. So glad you all went on that adventure with me. I'm going to shop, stop sharing all of this and you will see me again in just a moment. With that, I am going to go ahead and check out the Q&A to see if we have any questions, and then we'll wrap up our webinar for this morning. So, all right. Ooh, okay. Let's see here. Will we still be able to learn about number five? Let me peek around my laptop and remind myself what bone number five is. Um, this is a giraffe vertebrae, so a piece of a giraffe backbone. Now, I'm not sure where in the vertebral column it is, if it's a, um, a, a neck bone or if it's like a what's called a thoracic bone, so something that's more of like your upper back or your lower back, but this is a giraffe vertebra. So you can see a spot for the spinal cord, areas for more arteries and veins to go through as it's supplying that bone and those arteries and veins are going up to the brain. Our brain needs blood too. <laughs> so pretty cool. I know it's a really interesting bone. It's such a cool, cool shape. And we could tell by kind of the sail fin looking, the spine, that there are some big muscles that attach here too. Right? Giraffes are big. They have to be strong. <laughs> okay. And ooh, another great question. What is the most interesting bone you have observed? Hmm. I don't know. I kind of feel like they're all really interesting to me uh, because they all have something special to share and something different. And we just grazed the very top of all of the things that bones can teach us. Um, because we only have about 20 minutes this morning. So if you would like more information on bones, for sure, let us know in the chat. Um, we can expand this topic further because like I said, we just kind of barely touched the top of what it is uh, bones can teach us. Uh, but I would like to thank you all for joining me today. This was a lot of fun. Like I said, I am very honored um, to be able to share some of these items with you today. So, all right, with that, I would like to wish you all adieu um, and say that the zoo is excited to be able to welcome you back on June 13th. And be sure to check our website and our social medias for updated procedures with that opening. Uh, you will be required to wear a mask like the one I'm wearing or a cloth mask, uh, but do watch the website, keep up to date uh, with what those procedures are. And 
um, that we will also have timed free tickets available for you too. So make sure you get your reservation in um, on the day that you would like to come and visit us back at the zoo starting June 13th. So our last poll for the day, how much did you enjoy today's program? Uh, we do enjoy hearing your feedback. And with that, thank you all so much for spending some time with me this morning. And we can't wait to see you all back June 13th. Right, stay safe, stay healthy. Bye-bye.